welcome. I'm Jim Middleton from Sky News Australia. It is a commonplace to say that Australia's two most important relationships are with China and the United States. But for the first time in its history, the country finds itself in a position where its main ally is not its chief economic benefactor. And of course, that produces both opportunities as well as challenges. Over the next hour or so, we plan to cover the full gamut of the relationship between Australia and China, a freewheeling discussion. And as with this first, the first of these programs in Beijing earlier this year, this co-production between Sky News Australia and CCTV News, I am joined to facilitate the discussion by Young Ray, the long-serving and distinguished uh, presenter of CCTV News program. Hello, Dialogue. James. Ray, welcome to Sydney. Welcome to Australia. Thank you very much for being here. It's so good to be brought back to the centre stage for the second chapter of our co-production of a wonderful program. It's actually Dialogue Special of CCTV News. We are here to co-host a debate with Australians in collaboration with the Sky News. The biggest trading partner of Australia, China, however, does not share the same stakes with this ally of the US on all geopolitical issues. But with the peaceful rise of a strong global implications of the PRC, there is a strong appeal from more senior politicians and policymakers here in this vibrant host country that the growing might of China has to be recognized to level the playing field with other major competitors such as the United States. At the same time, people-to-people -people exchanges are gaining momentum. How does Australia position itself precisely in the emerging reconfiguration in the Asia-Pacific region? Shall we go back to the Cold War? Can the dynamic economic integration and cultural links help rebuild the trust between major economies in the region? Today, I'm very happy to be joined on the Chinese side by Victor Gao Zhikai, director of the National Association of International Studies. He's a regular star guest speaker on Dialogue, a daily current affairs talk show of CCTV News in Beijing. Next to him is Professor Zhang Feng, a senior research fellow with the National University of Australia, and of course he's an expert of international, stu international studies. He used to be a writer for editorials for Global Times, which is known for tough nationalistic position on world issues back in Beijing years ago. Now, next to him is William Dong, founder of uh, Handpicked Wines. I wonder if I can have a wine testing later on after the show. But uh, your job, I believe, is to promote co-prosperity cool between the major economies in this region. Back to you, James. Thank you, Ray. And uh, on the Australian side, we are honoured indeed to have present uh, today uh, Bob Carr, a former Australian foreign minister, but not only that, for many years, Premier of the biggest state of Australia, New South Wales, and responsible for much of the quality of life that we see in this beautiful city these days. Next to him, Alex Oliver from the Lowy Institute for International Affairs and responsible for one of the most interesting pieces of research that I've come across in this country for a very long time, which is an annual survey of Australians' attitudes to the rest of the world. And particularly this year, it has produced some very interesting results indeed on Australia's attitude to China, to Southeast Asia and to the United States. And I have no doubt that we'll be hearing a bit about that as the discussion proceeds. And finally, last but not least, the Australians, the Australian newspapers, editor at large, Paul Kelly, a singular influence and a singular writer on not just Australian politics, but a commentator too of uh, great respect on international relations. Welcome to you all. Thank you very much for being here. And Ray, as the guest, you should start the question. Let's take a seat and get Thank going. Thank you, James, for the nice introduction with so many distinguished guests because on both sides, I'm sure, we're ready to pick a fight. Bob, I interviewed you a few years ago when a wild bushfire threatened to engulf the Sydney city. You cut short your official visit, the first of its kind, to the Beijing municipal government. This time around, are you afraid that a new kind of a bushfire threatens to engulf the uh, freedom of navigation in the South China Sea? I'd like to first of all have your general assessment about the bilateral relationship between Australia and China. Yeah, there'll, there'll be a fundamental disagreement between Australia and China over South China Sea. Um, the Chinese attitude is that history 
bequeathed this stretch of water to China, that it's been Chinese territory and that's been recognised by the world. That's the Chinese position. Uh, the Australian position should be, would be, under um, either party in power in Canberra, the Australian position is always going to be that international law should determine questions of sovereignty uh, in this part of the world, in this stretch of water. Um, the question is, can diplomacy on both sides sustain the Australia-China bilateral relationship, so very important to both of us, through this, this disagreement? And I take a, a generally optimistic view that with serious diplomacy on both sides, we can withstand this, this fundamentally different approach. Ray, before we get to the Chinese side, because there's obviously some very interesting things we'd like to hear from Victor as well, I wonder if I could come back to you, Bob. Recent comments by the new Philippines President, uh, Victor Duterte, in Beijing suggest significant alienation of the Philippines from uh, the United States. Also, that uh, for the first time, a serious claimant state may in fact agree to substantive bilateral discussions with China. This is something that China has been seeking for many, many years. Does this suggest a new dynamism in what is going on in these disputed waters and that we may be seeing a new way in which these finally can be resolved, these disputes? Well, it's very, very interesting and I think it should have got more attention than it has received in Australia. Uh, you've got a, an ASEAN nation, you've got the Philippines saying under its new leadership, we will deal direct with China about this question of sovereignty. I think it's an opportunity if, if there's, it's an opportunity for the Chinese to show a bit of diplomatic subtlety here and move in and explore what I think is the ultimate solution to the disagreements over sovereignty, and that is resource sharing. This is something Resource you raised sharing. as foreign minister yeah, with yeah. the Chinese, I recall. Yeah, I, I raised it on both sides, and it provides the opportunity not, not simply for management of the dispute, while the differences over sovereignty remain, but the opportunity to set aside those differences and get on with developing the resource and splitting the proceeds in what the Chinese are fond of saying would be a win-win position. And I think, I think that we, we really do have an opportunity to explore that. Uh, it would certainly suggest to Australia, Australia that the approach we've been taking to date of making our views known through diplomacy and not by running patrols is the better approach. We'd look awfully foolish if we'd been running patrols up and down Scarborough Shoal and all of a sudden a change of government in the Philippines says, oh, hang on, uh, forget this, we can deal directly with China. Well, with a strong diplomatic background, uh, Bob seems to have given us a very rosy picture, although in a cautious manner, about the bilateral relationship between Australia and China. What's the voice from China, although you may not represent the Chinese government? Well, first of all, it's a great honor for me to be back in Australia, this land of greatness. And uh, China and the Philippines are not the only two countries in the world which have territorial disputes. There are many countries in the world, including, for example, between Australia and East Timor, which have uh, territorial disputes. Now, whenever you have territorial disputes, there are different ways to address the disputes. But China believes that the best way is to deal with the disputes through diplomacy, a peaceful negotiation, eventually uh, resulting in a win-win situation. And this is exactly what China and President Duterte of the Philippines try to do. And uh, this is the highway, uh, this is the better way to address the territorial disputes. And I hope those countries which are not direct claimants to the atolls, islands, reefs in the South China Sea would respect the willingness and the readiness of China and the Philippines to address these issues directly through peaceful diplomacy. That's the best way to address Victor, these Victor, it is all po also possible though to see this, uh, what has happened with the Philippines, with the new president, as an opportunity for China to divide and rule, rather than to uh, employ the diplomatic subtlety that Bob Carr was speaking about at a, at a moment, but to divide and rule and to further push the United States out of the equation. But James, first of all, is that the British legacy to divide and rule? Are we a humble student of the British diplomacy? First of all, first of all, uh, the Philippines is the only military ally uh, among the 10 ASEAN neighbor member states. So for the Philippines to have made a 180 degree turnaround 
in dealing with the territorial dispute in the South China Sea is very profound. History will record this as one of the major diplomatic developments in recent history. Now, secondly, I would say there is no need for divide and rule uh, for China, for any other countries. The United States is indeed a Pacific country. Its territory stretch all the way to the Guam and uh, the Saipan Islands, for example. The United example. States has been a Pacific power, but does it mean automatically at the same time that it should maintain the primacy of the U.S. maritime leadership, whatever the circumstances, the new dynamics in the circumstances? If we look at is the that U what you are saying? No, if we look at the U.S. argument, they advocate freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. Uh, can anyone cite one single example of obstruction or disruption of freedom of navigation in the South China Sea in recent years? There is no disruption of uh, freedom of navigation and China being the largest trading nation in the world. Uh, any disruption of freedom of navigation in the South, uh, South China Sea will do more damage to China than to any other country. Therefore, I think between China and the United States, if we are really talking about freedom of navigation, we can sit down together to talk about whatever aspects of the freedom of navigation. The danger is any country using the freedom of navigation as an excuse to achieve other objectives. That's what China is opposed to. And I think between China and the Philippines, the highway, the better way, is to negotiate with each other to achieve a mutually acceptable solution. Right. I wonder if I could bring in Paul Kelly here. This uh, development with President Duterte, uh, what does it mean? Does it mean there is a new dynamic uh, as far as these disputes over the South China Sea are concerned? What does it mean for the, for the United States and hence too for Australia? Well, I think it's potentially a very significant development. Of course, there's a degree of uncertainty at the moment as to exactly what is the Philippines' position. It seems to be sending different messages, saying one thing to China and another thing to the United States. But if we assume for the moment that there, ha that there has been a very important strategic shift on the part of the Philippines towards China and away from the United States, then that is clearly a critically important development, not just in terms of the South China Sea, but in terms of East Asian politics and strategic issues generally. The United States would be deeply concerned uh, about any uh, major repositioning of the Philippines, and certainly the United States Pacific Command in Honolulu would be profoundly alarmed uh, by any change uh, on that front. And certainly, to the extent this happens, this is a golden opportunity for China to engage with the Philippines in bilateral relations, in bilateral negotiations on this issue. But it remains to be seen, it remains to be seen just how genuine uh, and how bona fide uh, the new position of the Philippines is. Paul, I, you, uh, go ahead. Me, James, you seem to only focus on China and the United States as if it's a zero-sum game. However, in saying that, you have seriously ignored the other two serious parties to the same, in the same game, ASEAN as a regional bloc, as well as the domestic audience. You are, you are probably right that President Duterte, there's a newly elected president of the Philippines with a strong character, may have delivered conflicting messages to audiences in Beijing and those in Washington. However, all politics are local. What do you think of the uh, interplay between domestic politics, uh, the electorate in the Philippines, and the international society, particularly ASEAN, uh, who issued a joint statement that didn't mention at all the international arbitration ruling uh, about the maritime disputes in the South China Sea? That was viewed as a huge success of the Chinese diplomacy. Alex, you might be in a better position to make comments on what's going on here. Um, look. From a from a political perspective, probably not. Um, and I'm you know, aware of the ASEAN position, and it has been on, on it has been hesitant to come out and, and make even statements that have been as strong as those in the past. I'm not an ASEAN expert. From an from an Australian public opinion perspective, which is which is where I come from, and what I uh, the, the research studies that we've done, um, we are going back to the freedom of navigation point that you made earlier. Um, Australian the Australian people are, are very pro the freedom of navigation opportunities here. 75% um, of them in a recent poll were, were in favour of, of being able
able to conduct our own freedom of navigation operations, even though they've been discounted by our own government. So that's a, that's the position of the Australian population. As as to the ASEAN position, I'm going to I'm going to defer to you, Bob. Bob, yeah. a more sensational question about the future of yeah. President Duterte is whether we're going to have an ouster of this guy, like what happened in Venezuela, uh, following you know um, Hugo Chavez who died of cancer, and uh, Maduro, the new president, is said to be mired in domestic political upheavals. And behind the, the scenario uh, is, was the United States looking behind, I mean, uh, supporting the opposition party. Do you think the Philippines is likely to be turned into yet another Venezuela? Really? No, and uh, I, think, I think one gap in the Chinese perspective and the Australian perspective is indicated, uh, Ray, by, by that question. Um, I think I, I, I very often get from Chinese the view, is America behind the recent Philippines' assertiveness, going to international arbitration, for example, and I've seen no evidence of that. No evidence of the US manipulating the Philippines. I think there's enough in the domestic politics of the Philippines to explain why they have, until this new president, taken the position they've taken. I, I think the, pre the president's position, there, there's an element of, of um, uncertainty about the, the, the position being laid down by the Philippines at this time. It reflects the personality of one man, um, and it is. I think it's got to be seen as a great opportunity for China, some subtlety in Chinese diplomacy. If China, China were to concede fishing rights around Scarborough Shoal, for example, to strike a deal with the president. Victor, Victor if I could yeah. ask you on the question raised by Bob Carr of the possibility of China granting fishing rights to Filipino fishermen along the Scarborough Shoals and also his earlier suggestion, one which he did promote, both in China as foreign minister and also with ASEAN nations as well, for sharing of resources on the seabed and under the waters uh, of the South China Sea uh, before and not contingent on settlement of the territorial issues. Well, first of all, President <coughs> Duterte just came back from China uh, after a very successful state visit. He met with President Xi Jinping and other important Chinese leaders as well as college students, etc. Just name it, many media agencies. And I think the overall message was clear. The Philippines wanted to have more accelerated development. They need capital investment in their infrastructure. They want to have a railway and highways and port facilities build up. And President Duterte's position is that uh, while other countries can be helpful, only China can really deliver the critical mass of capital investment, infrastructure capabilities. Whether you agree with his conclusion or not, that's another issue. But apparently, the Philippines in such a stage that the benchmark, the litmus test of whether other countries can really provide substantive help is in the economic side. And I would say, China being as it is, the largest economy in the world, if we use purchasing power parity as the benchmark, the second largest economy, if we use the official exchange rate as the benchmark, can really work very, very constructively with the Philippines in all these aspects which are of vital interest to the Philippines. Talking about the fishing rights and other joint developments, <coughs> etc., I think indeed we need to recognize the territorial dispute between China and the Philippines, but the better way is to, while addressing the territorial disputes, let us focus on common development, joint developments, cooperation, so that both the Chinese people and the Filipino people can benefit in substantive ways to improve their living standards together. Just before we go to a break, uh, I would like to bring Paul Kelly back in and just to review this whole subject and particularly these developments involving the Philippines. Do you think that this development uh, potentially brings the United States and China closer to conflict over the South China Sea or makes it less likely? Oh, I don't think one can give a definitive answer to that uh, at the present time. Um, uh, the point uh, I'd make about this is that this is a really important test for China and America in terms of a clear strategic difference. And it's very important for the entire region to observe how China and America engage in this, engage with the region to try and reach a satisfactory diplomatic settlement. So, so I think this is, this is a test a test for Washington and Beijing, but also a test for the future of 
geostrategic stability in East Asia and the capacity to manage the emergence of a new balance of power in the region. Essentially what we're going to see is we're going to see the evolving of a new balance of power. Neither America nor China can fully achieve their own objectives in, in terms of the region. But what they've got to be able to demonstrate is a capacity to manage tition and manage their rivalry. So in that, in that sense, I think, as far as Australia's concerned, as far as the region's concerned, this is really a fundamental question. Well, before we conclude this, uh, no, we better, we, I think we had better wrap up the discussion on this issue. May I just ask one more question? One more question, please, uh, James. Uh, sorry okay. for this. But uh, why did the former uh, Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating says, uh, say uh, a growing might of China got to be recognized by the United States as the sole superpower with the end of the Cold War? A question for both sides. I think that is certainly a very sensible comment. In fact, that is one core co component of what uh, President Xi has proposed uh, in building a new model of great power relationship with the United States. Uh, the second component of that new relationship is mutual respect. Uh, so clearly the Chinese <laughs> are expecting the United States to show a greater degree of respect toward uh, what China regards as core interest and major concerns. Very briefly, Bob Carr. Paul Keating's comments. I, th I think Paul sees that Australia would be uh, of all the countries of the world, the one most comfortable with a G2, with an understanding, an understanding, a sophisticated deal between China and the US. Australia would have a big stake in that. And in the spirit of that perception, Paul Keating came out and said, Australia should stand back from running military patrols that provoke the Chinese, that challenge the Chinese in the 12 nautical mile radius around their structures. Do you do with the um, idea put forward really by must, Dr. Brzezinski? We really must wrap this up. Look, uh, thank you very much for the discussion, very deep and broad on the whole question of the geostrategic relationships between Australia, China and the United States. In a moment, we move on to the economic and financial implications of the relations between the two countries. Back in a moment. There is no more important economic relationship for Australia than that with China. It's pretty significant for China too. To introduce this segment of the discussion, Young Ray, would you like to lead off the questioning? Right. Uh, it's very difficult not to give you a hard time about the economic issues uh, since uh, the Australian government has decided to uh, uh, block sales of the largest uh, private land to a Chinese conglomerate uh, and you have also blocked a bit uh, for the purchase of uh, your national power grade, the Aust grade. Citing the reason of national security, I, along with many of my Chinese nationals, have been wondering aloud why the Australian authorities, uh, along with your Western allies, tend to cite national security to excuse the trade protectionism. Uh, uh, trade protectionism, that's something that, that you tend to help in domestic politics. So what do you think of uh, the Chinese uh, complaints? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I, I haven't received complaints put in that way, and I think for a, a very significant reason. And that is that very little Chinese investment proposed for Australia gets knocked back. Very little. You can count on one hand the examples of proposed Chinese investment that have been rejected. Um, the, you take the Kidman property, it, it was knocked back twice, but it is the biggest land holding in Australia. And a third bid involving the Shanghai-based company with an Australian partner is very likely, I would think, to receive Foreign Investment Review Board approval. The 50-50 uh, the, uh, the split in ownership between Australia and China made it very easy to justify before the Foreign Investment Review Board. And I think, as you saw in a, a deal with the Port of Melbourne, as you've seen on a lot of rural properties, if it's packaged properly, Chinese investment will be ticked off to the satisfaction of the Chinese financial interests who stand behind it. Very little is knocked. When a Chinese investment is, is rejected, it gets headlines. But if you look at the overall picture, the picture is a very, very positive of growing Chinese investment to the benefit of Australia and China in this country. Yeah, Victor, I, think... I wonder if I could ask you this question, which is, do you accept, as China accept, that national security and national interest uh, 
uh, justifiable reasons for determining foreign investment decisions. Would not China adopt exactly the same approach in terms of foreign investment in China as uh, does Australia with these questions of national security? And well, from interest? the Chinese perspective, uh, Australia is a great country of uh, free trade and market economy and as a rule uh, Chinese investments together with investments from all the other countries in the world coming to Australia should be welcomed uh, and also should receive equal treatment. In China our history is a little bit different. We started with planned economy. We are now very much developing into a market economy and I think uh, between China and Australia the more uh, respect we give each other for each other's uh, investment, the better. Uh, don't forget when Deng Xiaoping became the paramount leader of China, the true success of the Chinese economic transformation was to open its door widely to welcome uh, international investments. And this is still one of the main regions, uh, engines of the Chinese economic development. I hope the Australians will get the benefit, will create more jobs by welcoming FDI into Australia, including from China. Frank Zhang, you wanted to respond yeah. to what Bob Carr said? Yes, uh, I do have a couple of comments. Uh, I agree with Bob that um, if, ch if the Chinese companies can package their uh, bids uh, properly, they will probably have a higher chance of success. But on the other hand, uh, this kind of requirement for packaging, I think, uh, uh, indicates a real problem uh, regarding Australian investment uh, policy toward China. Uh, you, you mentioned the Melbourne port deal. Uh, in that deal, I think uh, Chinese ownership uh, is about only 20 percent. So that really doesn't indicate a very open attitude of Australia toward Chinese investments. I think what we really need here is more transparency and a more clear set of rules regarding Chinese investments in Australia. And the other might, day... Might, might come to the question of transparency and opacity in a moment with Paul Kelly, but Alex Oliver, first of all, is one of the complicating factors for Australian policymakers public attitudes? Because I think that in your survey, while there is a great deal of affection and growing affection for China uh, on the question of foreign investment and attitudes to that, it's a very different story indeed. And actually this concern has been shared uh, by all of us here mm. as to why mm. President Xi Jinping said at the G20 summit in Hangzhou, Zhejiang province, that uh, we need to have a better, uh, trans more transparent, uh, more predictable and more fair uh, policy envir environment for the Chinese investment along with other overseas investment here in Australia. What do you make of the uh, concerns by all of us here and particularly the issue that uh, President Xi Jinping took in the G20 summit. If I might just quickly add, yes, what, 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 what uh, the same, uh, if it were investments from the United States or Britain or Singapore, would the same requirements of packaging, proper packaging, still be essential to a su successful bid? Well, I'm old enough to remember when there were big questions here about US investment in mm. Australia and the public didn't like it back in the 1970s either. Nonetheless, US investment continued. But Alex, <laughs> to, uh, you, to your survey and its findings, which I think are very interesting and informative mm. here. Um, I think the point is it's not necessarily an opposition to Chinese investment, but it's, it's a sensitivity to investment in particular sectors. I rem remind you of the Archer Daniels Midland bid for Grain Corp, which got knocked back back in 2013, shortly after the coalition government was elected, saying that Australia was open bu for business. So it's not just Chinese investment, yeah, which an, is of concern. Bid. And that mm -hmm. was an American bid. Right. Um, the, the issue there, I think, is the sector. Australians, and uh, there's a domestic um, element here, um, which is Australians are incredibly sensitive about foreign investment in agriculture and in agricultural land holdings like the Kidman bid. 87% um, in our most recent public opinion poll in 2016, which only reinforced what we'd found out a few years earlier, 80% of Australians are, are strongly against foreign investment in agricultural, uh, ag agricultural holdings, wh whether it's Chinese or American or any other. There are a number of other sectors where Australians are sensitive, and I think that uh, goes to your point about um, uh, foreign investment in the, the Chinese bid in Osgrid um, and the Chinese bid for Kidman as well, and that is um, ports and airports and critical infrastructure projects. And you saw the sensitivity with the, with the, the acquisition of the Darwin port um, and, the, uh, and, the, and the American um, sensitivities about that, but that 
that transaction no, uh, no, no matter, it did proceed. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we're talking about a wholesale rejection of foreign investment, of Chinese foreign investment in these <coughs> sort of assets. Paul, um, Australia was one of the first Western economists to join AIIB. Uh, my question is, are you able to enjoy a more independent foreign policy uh, after granting release, lease of Davenport for 99 years to a land bridge group from China and the United States complained a lot bitterly about the uh, possible threat coming out from the Chinese uh, business presence there in the Davenport? I think it's wrong to see the Australia-China economic and financial and trade relationship being dictated by the United States or being shaped by the United States. I think that is a misunderstanding of Australian polity and a misunderstanding of the Australian national interest. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Australia uh, joined uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank uh, and that was at a time when the United States did not want Australia to make that commitment. So that is, I think, a very important uh, pointer here uh, to these sorts of issues. And Australia's national interest, our overwhelming national interest to develop and deepen the investment and the financial and economic relationship between Australia and China. There is a profound recognition of that in this country. It's a bipartisan commitment and that will proceed. I don't think uh, that the investment difficulties we've had in recent times uh, will poison that relationship at all. But there is a message for us. And the message is there needs to be a greater trust and more transparency when it comes to these sorts of foreign investment decisions. Foreign investment in Australia has always been a sensitive issue, whether we're talking now about Japan in the 1980s and 1990s, whether we're talking about China now. And uh, Australia will always be alert to its national interest in terms of foreign acquisition of agricultural land and foreign acquisition in infrastructure. Now in relation to the Ausgrid decision, all the Australian security agencies said there was a security problem. Now I think this is a very, very important point. And so it was vetoed on that basis. Now, we need to ensure there's no repeat of this situation. And that means both countries have got to sit down and talk about how we uh, build more trust and build more transparency into these decisions. Uh, James, don't you think we've been a little bit too heavy on big issues? Uh, let, let me go to yes, William indeed. for his comments on cool prosperity. That's the catchphrase in my vocabulary on this particular uh, uh, occasion. Now, uh, with the implementation of uh, President Xi Jinping's uh, supply-side uh, economic restructuring well underway in mainland China, do you think this is a very good opportunity for, uh, I mean, operation-wise, uh, a business executive like you to uh, sell wines and to benefit the domestic consumption of products coming out of the Australian market? Um, my personal view, yes, definitely. I think at the moment, um, Australia is making a perception for me, I think it's the wrong perception for the foreign investment. Um, I've been in the wine industry for 13 years and exported wine to China for, uh, in the last 12 years. And uh, I have a lot of friends or customers who want to come to invest in Australia and who love Australian products. Uh, but there's a perception problem is that they're thinking that it's very difficult for them to come and invest in Australia. Uh, and the other thing is that um, I've been selling wine in China in the last 12 years, and I've been trying to promote Australian wine. They love Australian wine. They love the food. They love the quality. The well, they people, love it so the much that uh, China but is now <laughs> Australia's biggest market for wine. It's just overtaken the United States, nearly $500 million worth a year. So obviously there's a, a market there, and they're lapping it up. Absolutely. I There's think no question about our hunger for more wines from Australia, but the issue is the table manners, perhaps. Uh. I, I, reckon <laughs> that, I reckon that at the moment, for, for example, in the wine industry, um, French wine is still number one in China. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the reason why in the last 10 years, especially, the um, increasing popularity of Australian wine in China, without, we haven't done much promotion in the country um, for wine. Um, it's still quite popular, and it's still the second um, um, popular wine in China at the moment. I reckon there's a reason to it, because of 
the perception about the land, about the quality of wine that we produce. Uh, and if we go to China and promote more about, the, the, about Australia and the product to the Chinese people, I think it's sooner or later will be number one. William, you know, does this go for other primary products from Australia, this clean green image, yeah. but the, the barrier to entry is not just simply the perception about foreign investment in Australia, but supply chain problems. Australia has not developed for its agricultural products the same kind of sophisticated infrastructure that it has very successfully for resources over the years. Is this a policy gap in Australia, something that could be fixed and if it were, would the sky be the limit? Well, I reckon the, it's quite important for Australia to attract investment from China, especially we are the largest uh, trade partner. Uh, I think the reason for doing that is one Chinese family who mo moved to Australia or to, to do some business in, in Australia, they will go and tell millions of people. So at the end of the day, they will benefit uh, the trade, uh, business, or the product, what we are doing. So. Well, uh, China yeah. is uh, one of the biggest beneficiaries of uh, uh, freedom of navigation and yeah. free commerce going through waterways of the Pacific Ocean. Having said this, now, despite tight control on the capital flight, uh, capital, I mean, I'm talking about capital control, there's more such, a, there are going to be more such moves like uh, mergers and acquisitions in the overseas market. Uh, but what kind of legal risks will the Chinese investors be facing in the Australian market? Uh, will there be IPR violations? Uh, what kind of risks are we going to face? Let's do some kind of assessment. Uh, well, at this stage, I'm not very sure. I'm not very sure what the risks are, what, the, what worries the Chinese investment to, to Australia. I think it's important to have transparency um, in the system and um, to, to make the Chinese people feel, hey, you guys are welcome. And I want to, it's important to understand uh, what the people really want. And it's important for the investors to understand you're welcome, but there's a system in place. So make it very clear to them so then they know exactly what they can do, what they can't do. Right? Especially, you, um, Alex mentioned earlier, the system is not just to the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to make it clear that it's not just for the Chinese people, it's for the so same question goes to uh, yeah, this side. Obviously. Indeed it does, but I'm afraid uh, I think our time is <laughs> You and I could discuss Australian wine and no doubt French wine as well till the cows come home, as we say in Australia, but we had better move on. In a moment, we'll be back to discuss cultural connections between Australia and China. At the moment, uh, China is the biggest source of uh, tourists to Australia, over a million last year. Also, the biggest source of foreign students as well. There is plenty more to discuss in that area, and we'll be back in a moment. In this to regard, do just we are that. likely to build more consensus. <laughs> mm. Australia and China may be very different societies with very different systems of government, but that uh, does not mean that we do not share a lot in common. Australians have been going to China in increasing numbers over the years, both to look around and also to study. And for Australia, China is now the biggest source of foreign tourists. One million last year, a massive increase over the past decade. It is also the largest source of foreign students in Australia as well, and a great source of foreign income for Australia. Ray, to kick off this uh, part of the discussion, uh, a question from you. Bob, I was uh, impressed uh, <coughs> quite a few years ago when you were watching a football match. Uh, you, uh, some people said you were reading a book about philosophy instead of uh, focusing <laughs> on the this competition. Is, this is an insane myth <laughs> without any basis in fact whatsoever that's grown up. I'm, I'm now rather proud of it. But, it, but Bob, uh, what do you think of uh, the cultural links between our two countries uh, from, for example, a perspective you've been more interested in? Philosophy, cultural history, whatever. Just let us know your understanding about the cultural background against which the uh, uh, relationship, relationship between the two major economies should be further improved. Well, Ray, here's my perspective. Uh, Australia's major relationships have been very different from this one that figures so big today, the relationship with China. For a long time, we were part of the British Empire. We were very comfortable. We had no declaration of independence from the British Empire. We liked the British Empire. Then post-World War II, we were part of the US alliance system. 
and we share so many American values that that too was a comfortable relationship. We had a, a very important economic relationship with Japan and Japan was something of a multi-party democracy with freedom of expression. It, it, it too was allied with the United States. So it wasn't, wasn't a great deal that challenged us. But now comes China. China is huge and China has different political values. It's a, a Marxist-Leninist state. Um, China's developing a market economy and its public sector is uh, small, its public sector is smaller by some measures than the public sector in Australia, which is interesting. But it's a civilizational power. It traces a continuous cultural history back 4,000 years or so. And it's got a confidence that comes with that. Now, we've never had a relationship with a nation that figures so big for us, with fundamentally different political values, imbued with the confidence that comes with being a civilizational power. And Australians are thinking, what is this? Because nothing in our history has prepared us for a relationship with a re-emergent China. Victor, and uh, how does uh, Bob's uh, analysis, analysis sit with Chinese perceptions of what Australia is. When well, Bob we, Carr goes high, it doesn't mean we'll go low. Well, uh, we, <laughs> you're aside, you're aside, please. First of all, I think we are living in a changing world, and the changes are profound and very, very fast forward move, moving. So we all need to catch along with the megatrends in the world. Whoever who is left behind will do so to his or her own detriment. Uh, for Australia, in China, we have great goodwill and friendship. Uh, for Australia. I think, you know, except very few things, uh, most of my countrymen hold Australia in great high esteem and the admiration for many things, including Australian wine, will be profound. And that makes it good and very reliable for developing good relations between China and Australia. China has been there not just for 4,000 years, but 5,000 years with recorded history. And it has been a continuous, never interrupted civilization. And I think if we look at the world today, as I mentioned, China is already the largest economy and the most important country in many, many aspects. China is not only the largest trading nation with Australia, China is the largest trading nation with more than 130 countries in the whole world and the second, if not the third largest trading partner for the rest of the countries. And William, I think the Chinese economy, economic development will continue in the coming years. It's better for Australia to readjust to the changing world, including in its relations with China. No, my, my question is about the Australian side, actually, gentlemen, the ladies and gentlemen, is uh, the uh, token language of Australians, among others, uh, might include uh, the mascot of uh, Kangulu and the koala. Uh, that may have given us a very misleading impression about the image of Australia. You are honest, you are kind, you are very polite. But below and behind the surface. Uh, do you think uh, there's a lot more sophistication for the Chinese to take more seriously when it comes to the cultural exchanges? We have one million Chinese here. Uh, uh, among, uh, I mean, the total population is down there at 24 million, and the one million are Chinese with Chinese ancestry or China born. Altogether, we have so many Chinese. Uh, do you think uh, we, uh, we can have more uh, dis discord, uh, discrepancies, or are you going to have more integration, Bob? Yeah. I think Australia is well positioned to accommodate the changing world of the 21st century and in particular the rise of China. Now there's always been goodwill on the part of the Australian people towards China. There's no doubt at all that the people to people relationship is going to be fundamental in the future and our disposition as a multicultural society is fundamental here. As you say, we're a country of 24 million people and one million people who live here are of Chinese background. We have a couple of hundred thousand Chinese university students in this country. And this dynamic change in the population, this dynamic change in the culture of the country is proceeding effectively. And of course, there's no trade-off here. If you're a multicultural country, then you can enjoy good relations with the United States, with various countries of Asia, with our traditional uh, uh, parental uh, uh, nation, Great Britain. So there's no, there's no choice here. Uh, and I think that the strong sense of identity of Australia as a multicultural nation 
will uh, further enhance the people-to-people -people relations between Australia and China. Alex, what do you distill from what we've been talking about, Bob's analysis, for example, and also Victor's as well, uh, in, in terms of your research about what are the opportunities here and what are the missing elements in terms of a greater development of cultural relations between Australia and China when we are so inevitably linked, not just by geography, but by economics as well? Well, you fixed on, um, from perspective of Australian public opinion, where the strength of the relationship is, and that is in the cultural and people-to-people -people ties. When we ask Australians how they feel about China, and there are a, a number of elements of China's you know, presence in Australia, um, Chinese people you've met, China's cultural and history, its economic contribution to our economy, investment in Australia, it, Time and again we get positive responses towards Chinese people and China's cultural and history and China's economic contribution to our prosperity. They're the positive strands in the relationship and they're what we can build on. You've already mentioned um, China being our largest trading partner. We have a free trade agreement with China now. Um, China's actually been our largest trading partner since 2007, so that's well established. And when we ask Australians how they feel about the free trading arrangements, for example, they're very positively disposed to that, not just in terms of its contribution to our economy, which they say is actually quite neutral, but because it's good for relations between the nations. We also have a new Colombo plan, which is based on the Colombo plan from the 1950s and 60s, which was a tremendously effective public diplomacy and and development initiative in the past and that's been built on by this current government and in fact had its seeds I think in in earlier government where we now send Australian students around Asia but particularly to China and I think at the last count we had over 800 Australian students in China learning Chinese education being embedded in China, China Chinese universities and in businesses and so that's one of the ways in which Australian government policy is starting to build better on those people-to-people -people ties where already we have quite some strength. Bob, I was going to ask you about one of the implications perhaps of your analysis of uh, this relationship now. Australia and China nonetheless remain very, very different societies with totally different forms of government. Australia is no more going to accept a Chinese form of government than China is going to accept Australia. So where does that leave Australia heading into the future as far as this is concerned? No longer tied to the apron strings of Britain, no longer tied to the purse strings of the United States, but in a very much a brave new world? Well, it's a matter for us to explore. This is what makes dealing with the Australia-China relationship so exciting. These are uncharted waters for both of us. I think the dynamic in the situation that opens opportunities is the change in China. Too many people in Australia comment about China without ever having visited the Chinese cities. <coughs> and simply, I'd take Australian opinion, opinion leaders up to China and just say, I want you to go to four Chinese cities, and I want you to wander around them. You are struck by the fact, the visible presence, all the manifestations of China moving towards rich world status. We can say it's, it's middle income status, but they're getting pretty close to pulling off the trajectory that South Korea, Singapore pulled off, before them Japan, of going from undeveloped to advanced world status. This is the revolution that's manifest in China, and it's bringing China closer to us in values. Just as we became closer to, for example, Singapore in the 1950s, we would have regarded as a, as a part of low-paid backward Asia. Um, now they're on a par with Australia and therefore easier to deal with. The same with the other Asian tigers, the same with Australia and Japan. This is happening with China. As China approaches our living standards, per capita living standards, it is easier for Australians to understand, it's easier for both sides to deal with one another. Just remember this. Um, our old visions of China, our, our old image of China has got to be discarded. In the, uh, up till very recently, southern China, the Pearl River Delta produced seven out of ten of the world's shoes. It no longer does. Mm. But it produces seven out of ten of the world's drones. China's becoming more like us. And therefore, easier, not harder to understand and to deal with. Bob, we've been covering uh, Olympics <coughs> all the time, and we were so impressed by your performance in the pool, the swimming pool.
given the long <laughs> coastline of Australia. So he was reading a book. He, <laughs> Bob put his finger on a very interesting issue. Uh, China is having a very strong and uh, growing presence of the middle income families. Uh, the West would uh, like to call it the middle class. Uh, mm -hmm. It means. Uh, does it mean we're going to have a more robust domestic consumption about the sports product, uh, like um, something we can learn from Australia? Yeah. This country is pretty sporty. Before we uh, come to the sports issue, let me just add very quickly a couple of points. China is already the largest importer of Mercedes-Benz cars, the largest importer of French wines, the largest importer of Rolex watches, for example. So talking about the expansion of the middle uh, income population in China. It's happening as we speak. It's one of the mega trends uh, between uh, China and Australia and in the world today. Now, talking about the sports activities in Australia, I would say, for example, if the what Australians are the big names can, you can remember can about the Australian athletes, lots of them, actually, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the swimming pool in particular, and also on the tennis, etc. And I think uh, if Australian can offer tutoring services to train Chinese athletes, actually, Sun Yang was trained here in Australia, uh, and he became a national hero in China. And uh, both countries will benefit. Now, we also talked about tourism, one million Chinese tourists, but one million Chinese Chinese tourists only account for less than 1% of annual Chinese tourists visiting everywhere in the world. Just imagine, through China and Australia's joint efforts, we increase that from less than 1% to 10%. You are talking about 10 million Chinese tourists coming to visit Australia. How much money they will bring and spend here in Australia? How much new jobs they can help uh, create in Australia? That's the commonality of our destinies together. We are different in political systems, of course, but there are more things in common between China and Australia which can bind us together, reinforce each other and that's the greater tomorrow that we should focus our attention on between China have, and Australia. Uh, the swimmer of Sun Yang but also the tallest basketball player for NBA, <laughs> Yao Ming, <laughs> right, Yao Ming, <laughs> but not Yao Ming in Chinese. But what, what, what do you think of the con allegedly controversial sp state sponsorship for the wonderful performance of the Chinese athletes? Uh, this is something that has caused debates on both sides. I think uh, Ray you made a uh, couple of very important points here regarding the uh, state, let's say, property uh, from China, state-owned companies, which was a point you mentioned earlier, and, and state-sponsored um, uh, sports games. I would like to make a point about the state-owned enterprises, which is a very important mm -hmm. uh, issue here in Australia. The other day, the Deputy Foreign Minister said very explicitly that he doesn't like state-owned enterprises investment in Australia. Um, that, I think, is a very important issue because uh, you know, state-owned ent enterprises still, still dominate the uh, Chinese economy, although uh, private enterprises are growing as well. So if Australia make investment decisions on the basis of whether those companies from China, state-owned or not, is going to block out a lot of Chinese investments. Paul so Kelly, is this something that uh, Australian governments need to address? Because it's not just the current government, but the previous government, which had significant reservations about state-owned enterprises investing in Australia? Uh, well, there are different rules for state-owned enterprises, and I don't think those rules will uh, fade away. Uh, but I think it's important that issues be assessed on merit. There is very significant uh, investment in this country from Chinese state-owned enterprises. That's an uh, inevitable fact of life. We want Chinese investment, and therefore a lot of that investment does involve state-owned enterprises. And there's an acceptance of that. There are, there are rules in place. There are rules in place to look at that, to uh, investigate that. We shouldn't be surprised about that. But uh, the point I'd stress overall is that most Chinese investment uh, decisions relating to this country, most Chinese investment requests are in fact granted. They are granted overwhelmingly. So when we're looking at the problems, we should also see the problems in context. And the context overall is a very good news story. Your, your newspaper has got a front page story today about a Chinese investment that was controversial when it was approved Cubby by Station. For Cubby Station. Right. It was approved by uh, Treasurer Wayne Swan, Treasurer in the previous Labor right. government, 
And it was the biggest holder, the company is still the biggest holder of, of irrigation licenses in Australia. Mm -hmm. It is the biggest irrigation property. The water held on that property mm -hmm. is twice the size of all the water in Sydney Harbour. So and it has been very successful. Very su successful. When it was approved, the front page of one of our newspapers said, Labor sells the farm. <laughs> Labor sells the farm. But it's been an outstanding success, and the local community in rural Queensland that hosts this farm is happy with the Chinese ownership, happy with it. The same is true of Tully Sugar, the same is true of in Chinese investment in the, uh, in the Ord River in the north of Western Australia. It's overwhelmingly a positive story. We shouldn't become fixated on the very small minority of cases that become controversial and lead to a refusal. Um, and, and I just want Chinese to understand, who have got very positive views, because my institute has measured them in an opinion poll, Chinese business leadership has positive views. They rate Australia as the best place to invest in the world. They're, we're ahead of Germany and but Canada can I, uh, and, and bring you the guys US. back to the issue of sports? Because uh, 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 I have heard <laughs> these. Uh, the friendly, uh, I mean, you eat beside the in Chinese, right? Uh, it mm. means the French would come first, the competition second, but it's no longer so. Competition does matter for the two countries uh, which might get closer. For example, Australia's National Basketball League announced a deal to broadcast every game of the 2016-17 season into China. The National Basketball League is keen to expand and uh, Ali Sports, Ali Sports and Sina Sports will both stream every game live on their Chinese platforms with Mandarin commentary and graphics. NBL General Manager Jeremy Luger called it a new frontier for Australian sport. What does that mean for the sports fans on both sides? It will make Australia more known to China and uh, increase the commonality that these two great nations will share for many years to come. And I don't think, you know, between China and Australia, we should be distracted by the political differences. I think in terms of economic common destiny, in terms of the people-to-people -people exchanges, there are lots of things that we should focus on and build our momentum. China and Australia, in a sense, share common destinies, at least in the economic, trade, cultural, uh, people-to-people -people exchanges. Lots of these commonalities and, and, and should do, be And do you guys think the Olympic agreement. spirit as well as sports are the universal language that we can share without any questions? Yeah, yeah, but from my perspective, I'd like Australia to get off talking about its sporting <laughs> achievement and start talking about the young scholars and uh, Australian science achievements and some of our innovative uh, start-up business people. I think we've got to find a new way of selling ourselves to the world that doesn't doesn't invoke the old stereotypes of uh, Australia's sports people and some other stereotypes as well. But listen, surely we are smart enough. We Australians of the current age and the Chinese who've been produced by this extraordinary revolution that took place in China, the most successful revolution of the 20th century, uh, the economic transformation set in train by Deng Xiaoping, the greatest leader, I think, of the 20th century, given the impact of these changes, surely we are smart enough to say we can surmount the barriers and challenges of language and civilization and history and political system, above, above all, to forge a creative bilateral relationship. And surely our diplomacy, practiced and, and schooled over, over many years, can get us to a point where we can achieve positive outcomes. Uh, South China Sea, which we discussed earlier as a case in point, easily, easily uh, capable of a diplomatic solution if both sides are, are sensible and smart and think of the long term. Ray, this, I promised you a freewheeling discussion. We also yes, got indeed, one which was both frank rolling. and good natured and yes. covered a lot of topics. Uh, I appreciate the presence of all of the panellists here at this session between uh, Sky News Australia, CCTV News. May there be many, many more of them indeed. And thank you all. It's for indeed watching. a landmark success for both sides to have a wonderful and fruitful exchanges on important issues. Thank you very much, guys, thank and you. you. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it.